special encounters with the Holy Spirit to take us to another level is what I'm saying. The Bible tells us this in Ephesians 5.18. Do not be drunk with wine. You know the scripture. For that is what? Debauchery, but rather be, what does it say? Filled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, can you all see that font in the very back? Can you see that font? I know we had some problems with our lights, so we're going to try to get those adjusted this Sunday. Some problems with our lights, something went out. But nevertheless, if you can, can you all see that font okay? Okay, good, because I could always enlarge if need be. But the Greek scholars would tell you that not only, not only do you have the Holy Spirit living within you, we need ongoing fillings, and it's continual. This is in the present tense. Keep being ever filled with the Holy Spirit. Amplified Bible says this, notice, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but ever be filled, stimulated with the Holy Spirit. So certainly we believe in the Spirit-filled life, and we need God's Spirit within us to lead us and guide us. As a matter of fact, when you look in this passage of Scripture, it's very clear, this chapter 5 here, listen to this, he says, walk in the Spirit. Then he says, that's in verse 16, we're to be led by the Spirit. That's in verse 18. Then we're to live by the Spirit. 25. And then we are to keep in step with the Spirit. All these really are referring kind of to the same thing, but just a little dynamic. But the bottom line is you and I ought to seek to follow, listen to, discern the will of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life and be very sensitive to living the Spirit-filled life. So this morning I'm speaking about being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. And that's really what he's discussing here in this chapter. So if you have your Bibles there, begin in chapter 5, verse 16 of Galatians. Would you please stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word of God for those who can. We believe the Bible is the inspired, the inerrant, the infallible Word of God. And so we like to honor this book and uh, what we're reading. Notice, if you will, verse number 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another. Conflict, notice that. He goes on to say, keep you, that, that try to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led, that's the key, led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, by the way, notice the word plural, works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, and orgies. And these things, notice what he says. As I warned you, as I warn you, really again he's saying, notice, those who do such things will what? Do you have to be a theologian to understand what he's saying there? No, I don't think so. But the fruit of the Spirit is, notice, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You're good. <laughs> Y'all need to let me catch up with y'all. <laughs> and those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, praise the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I didn't expect y'all to speak out like that, but that's all right. I want to share several principles this morning about being led by the Holy Spirit of God. I will tell you, we are a church that wants to be led by the Spirit. We want to hear from the Spirit, be sensitive to the Spirit, discern the voice, the movement of the Spirit of God in our life. And I think it's so very critical. And really, that's what you see when you read the book of Acts. But I want to share several things here about the Spirit-led life. Number one, understand that there is an ongoing conflict. An ongoing conflict. Listen to me. I don't care how long you've been a believer. When you give your life to Christ, you make a decision to follow Him. How many of you know? It doesn't take very long to realize that something radical has taken place in your life. As a matter of fact, the things you used to do, you don't want to do. But eventually, it's not going to be long. You're going to realize there's another 
force trying to lead you outside where the Spirit of God is trying to lead you to go. And that's what he's speaking about here. He's talking about a conflict, a spiritual battle. And uh, all I know, it didn't take me long to realize that the Holy Spirit who lives in me wants to lead me in a new direction. He doesn't want me to go the right direction I was going. He wants to have a change, a direction in my life. And uh, that's what he does. But we need to understand this because I think sometimes people get very confused. They become a Christian. They're committed to Christ. They have the Spirit of God living within them, but yet they still have to wrestle. They still have some conflicts in their life when it comes to other fleshly desires. And if you don't realize that, my friend, you're going to become confused. You're not going to understand what the Christian life is all about. And I'm just trying to tell you, it's natural to have this pull in your life spiritually because something new has happened in your life. You have been changed. Your spirit is alive now. He wants to live for God. He's leading you. But then you have the old flesh, that old nature, trying to lead you another direction. So you need to understand that that conflict is always there. Notice again in our scripture, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit. That means your lifestyle. Be led by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. And notice this, they're opposed to one another. The flesh doesn't like the spirit. The spirit doesn't care for the flesh. And again, you don't have to be a believer very long to realize that there's an opposition there within your life because the spirit of God wants to take you to deeper levels in Christ. In other places in the Bible, this old nature, it's it's called the old nature. It's called the flesh, right? It's called the old what? The old man. Did I hear that? Notice about what the Bible says here in Ephesians. That you put off... Concerning your former conduct, the old what? That old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Be renewed in your spirit of the mind. Put on the new man that was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Notice in Colossians we read the same kind of thing. But now you yourselves are to put off these. Notice there's a putting off. By the way, notice you've got a, you've got a responsibility here. Do you see it? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and you have put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. The new NIV, or the the New International Version, the English Standard Version says the new self. Here's the bottom line. When you give your life to Christ, first thing, we will be in a struggle. There's going to be a conflict. Your spiritual man within you, that new man, that new creature, that new creation in Christ that is, he's going to be pulling you one way. The old nature, that old man's going to try to pull you the other way. When you were a kid, notice this picture. I don't know if you ever did this or not. Did you ever play tug of war as a kid? Which, which group usually wins, by the way? The stronger ones on the other end, right? And here's the issue. Who are you feeding? If you feed that spiritual man, guess what? You're going to have a spiritual strength through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But if you feed the fleshly man, guess who's going to pull you the wrong way? Outside the boundaries of God. So number one, we need to understand this tug of war. Number two, realize the battle is daily. Realize it's daily. Listen to me. Until we get to heaven, (laughs) until we get to heaven, we're going to have this battle that's going to be going on. Are you ever going to reach the point of stage in this life that you're never going to have another battle with the flesh? Say no. As a matter, because why? We wake up in the flesh. We still have this body. Our minds are being renewed, but they're not totally transformed. Right? We still have this flesh. We got to deal with. And because we have flesh and blood, my friend, there's this conflict that is happening. And by the way, it's going to be happening every day in different ways. Different ways. I'll give you some more principles here. But again, every day we have battles. You know, you can wake up one day, maybe you're on a spiritual mountaintop. Maybe everything's going wonderful in your life. I mean, no issues, no challenges. I mean, you feel like you could walk on the clouds, but then suddenly the next day comes. How many of you know what I'm speaking about here this morning, huh? 
The next day comes and something enters your life and it pulls you down spiritually. And then there's this old flesh or, you know, it could be something at the workplace, you know, some kind of an argument or something with a co-employee or the boss or something like that. It could be in the family unit, as a matter of fact, right? These things do happen, but it's a daily battle. Notice again, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. The desires of the spirit are against the flesh. So why is there a battle? Because every day you wake up, you've got this body. That old nature is still there, though we ought to reckon him dead, and I'll mention more about that in, in a minute. But listen to this. Do you think the Apostle Paul ever had to deal with this in his life? Do you think Peter ever had to deal with this in his life? Very familiar passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 7. Notice, this is Paul speaking. Notice, for I, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. He says, for I have the desire to do what is right. I really want to do that, but not the ability to carry it out in the flesh. He's speaking about. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not one is what I keep on doing. There's a little tongue twisters, aren't they? Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So, I find a new law within me, he says, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and enter in my inner being, that new man, but I see in my members, that is my body, my flesh, another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Now I want you to think about it. Here you've got, here you have the Apostle Paul committed unconditionally to the Lordship of Jesus. I mean, listen, he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. God used him, but yet he still says. He still says, I struggle. I want to live in perfection. But this old body, these challenges are still there for me. It's not that he can't overcome many things in his life, but as much as he wants to live a perfect life, he still can't do it because of this old nature, this body that is pulling him another way. Now, so here's what I want to just say, a couple of sub points. Listen to me. Because his battle is raging, number one, stay in a state of readiness. Stay in a state of readiness, so very critical. You know, many times, listen to me, many times when you've had the greatest victory in your life spiritually, guess who's going to be knocking on your door? Stay in readiness. Put on the armor of God. The Bible says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Listen to me, not only do we have this flesh and blood, but we have the enemy. We have the enemy, he's doing everything he can, and he understands the weakness of the flesh. He's going to do everything he can to pull you down. So the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. There is a demonic realm. I know many churches may say, I don't believe there's a demonic realm. My friend Jesus said there was a demonic realm. He had to deal with it. And they're here today, I can guarantee you that. Notice, spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to do what? Stand in the evil day, having all, done all to stand. So again, notice again, get dressed spiritually. Thirdly, don't let your guard down. I think sometimes you and I can grow spiritually or have these wonderful experiences and we think that certain sins aren't going to affect us anymore. My friend, how many, how many of the men of God have we seen in the last 10, 15 years? I'm talking about men in pulpits, people that were committed to God, but yet they allowed their guard to go down as a result. They have fallen. Now they're no longer in the ministry. And I'm just simply saying to you, listen, what about David, a man after God's own heart? Look what he did. Do not let your guard down is what I'm saying there. And then realize you need ongoing and filling to the Holy Spirit, and that's the focus. Again, we will never outgrow the need to be filled with the Spirit. Okay? And then don't become weary in battle. Do you ever get weary in battle? Man, you've been praying, you've been seeking the Lord God, you've been doing everything you know to do, and 
You just feel sometimes down and out. Have you ever been there? I've been there, sure. I'm sure you have too. Notice the scripture. I love it. It says, And let us not grow, what does he say? Weary of doing good. For in due season we will do what? But notice there's a qualifier there. Qualification. If we do not, what does he say? Give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. You stay committed. And God's going to see you through. Notice a little picture here. This guy, he must have been out there doing some farming. He's got him a little crops there. He has reaped a harvest. Folks, I don't know about you, but I want to reap in my life. You know, I'm 66, but I want to keep reaping in my life. The Bible talks about even those in old age can reap fruit in their life. So again, reaping is so very critical. But then thirdly, I want you to see this. Um, let, me, let me just kind of share this real quick. The illustration. When I was in... Uh, when I was in Dadeville, Missouri. Anybody been to Dadeville, Missouri? How many have ever heard of Dadeville, Missouri? One. Dadeville, Missouri. Metropolitan town of 219 people. That's my first little church I pastored out there. Had about 70 people out of the 219 went to First Baptist Church. So they came there. But there was a farmer inside our church who was a deacon. And I did some plowing for him. I went out and had to pick up some bales of hay. You know, when you're in college, you need all the little extra shekels that you can get in life, right? But one thing I know is that these guys worked and tilled the soil. And some years were good, some years were not good. But here's what I know. If you'll hang in there, be tenacious, don't give up, don't yield, don't give in. Guess what, my friend? You're going to reap. You're going to reap what you've sown there. So... And then thirdly, don't under underestimate the various temptations of the flesh. I've alluded to this, but I think it's critical to realize that this gravitational pull in our lives remains constant. Now, it lessens, right? I mean, the deeper we become in our relationship with Christ, the more we're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, it does deepen, but I'm just saying, be careful do not think that somehow you're impervious to the temptations that come your way in this life when it comes to sin. Now, I want you to remember, who is Paul writing to in Galatians? He is writing to spirit-filled, anointed believers. He's not writing to the unbelievers. He's writing to spirit-filled believers, and he has some warnings. Notice. Verse 19-21, through 21, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, he says, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, first of all, he talks about sexual morality. Do you think we have that kind of a problem today in our culture? Really, this originally referred to any excess of lack of restraint, but, I mean, that is, that is immorality, was a lack of restraint, but again, so what, what is, what's the difference between adultery and fornication? Fornication is sexual sin, it becomes adultery when you do it outside marriage, see? But immorality comes from that word pornea, pornea. What word sounds like pornea? Pornography, right? That's where, that is the root of this word. So he's talking about pornography. Do we have a problem with pornography in the day in which we live? Well, major issues. So again, he's dealing these first three items as sexual sins. Impurity means that which is unclean. It was used medically to refer to an infected, oozing wound. Impurity, sexual impurity. Sensuality, this is the word that really... It's unrestrained sexual indulgence. Do you believe that speaks about the culture in the 21st century today? No restraint, do whatever you want to do, whatever feels good. You just do that, you live like that? I mean, is that not where we are today in the culture in the 21st century? Unrestrained? I think so. Unbridled sensuality is what he's speaking about. In the, and in the children of Israel, think about this. Jeremiah said, and I really believe this is where we are. I think I shared this verse a few weeks ago. Notice, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No. They were not ashamed. They did not even know how to blush 
You listen to me. We are living in a time where people have forgotten to blush over their sins. And instead of blushing, listen, they are proud of their sexual immorality. They parade it in the streets. I mean, they listen, they advertise it. They want you to believe it's okay. My friend, listen, I will just simply say to you, the Word of God does not change, period. What he says then is true today. And then, of course, he talks about idolatry. You say, well, I don't, I don't practice idolatry, Pastor. Let me just simply say this. Anything you put in your life first before God becomes your idol. Sorcery. Listen to this word. Translates the Greek word pharmakia. What does that sound like? Pharmacy. Drugs. Right? Do we not have an epidemic of drug use here in America today? Drugs. Many of these occults, even during that time, would use these various drugs in their pagan worship. And by the way, they do it today. Did you know that? What is the name of that one drug some of the Indian tribes use? Is it peyote? Something like that? Did you see where Janet Yellen ate some of those uh, mushrooms recently that were given to her in China? Did you all see that? You know, there's, there's groups of religious groups trying to say, oh, we want to take our spirituality, go outside our natural realm and have this hallucina hallucinogenic kind of experience. My friend, I'm telling you, it's very dangerous, but it's not old. It's, it's, it's there. Occult practices. Enmity means hateful attitudes. My goodness, I don't know about you, but I've never seen more hate, more evil. People getting beat up for no reason at all. Strife. In the New Testament, this word is unique to Paul, used nine times to characterize the strife and discord that beset so many congregations. The, uh, the New English Bible translates translate this contentious, contentious temper, jealousy. Uh, certainly that can happen in our lives. Fits of anger, fly off the handle is what we would say. You can't excuse that, you know, the old Irish temper. I'm Irish. Pam, uh, what is your background? Say, you can say that louder. What are you? Irish. <laughs> you cannot excuse your Irish, you know, background. Fits of anger, it talks about rivalries. I really found this a unique term, rivalries. It talks about, it's a term derived from the political culture in ancient Greece where politicians are trying to go up the ladder. They have all, do we have some rivalries happening today in the 21st century in the political realm? Whoa. You know. Thank God for godly people in political office. We ought to pray for them and encourage them, right? But at the same time, it's, it's these guys who are just running each other down, trying to get above, and dissensions. Used, on many, used one other occasion in Paul's letters in Romans 16, 17. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Divisions, envy, the list goes on. Drunkenness. By the way, let me just simply say this. Spirit-filled believers have no business being drunk on alcohol or any other drug. Orgies, revelings, carousing. This word means revelings, carousing, wild parties. Oh, we're going to have party and carouse, you know, bar hopping. These. No, no, no. Those are not to be in your life. My friend, you listen to me. We are to be distinct from this world system, is what I'm saying. Jesus gives a similar list. He says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. Okay? Now, Here's the high point of some of the things he's saying here. Notice what he says in this next verse. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things, what does it say? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, you do not have to be a theologian to understand that. If this is your life, notice again though, he's straight, there's one key word there because I think you need to see this one word. He says those who practice these things things you know do such things the the tense is practicing these things will not inherit the kingdom of God here's the issue if a person can live habitually a lifestyle 
in this way without any conviction of the Holy Spirit of God in their life. They need to go back and evaluate whether or not they're really saved. Because what he's emphasizing, you will not practice that kind of a lifestyle if you know Christ. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. He's going to lead you away from that kind of a lifestyle. You will not have this propensity in you to live like this. The Spirit will convict you. He will speak to you. Will He not? And if you're living like you, you will not practice that kind of a lifestyle. So those who profess to know Jesus, if you live like that, my friend, you ought to go back to the cross and say, I need to have a little talk with Jesus. As a matter of fact, notice what 1 John says. I, I think this is so very clear. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. That is, no one who's been born again of the Spirit of God, a new, a new believer in Christ, if you give your life to Christ, you will not make a practice of sinning. For God's seed, I think he's talking about the Holy Spirit. His seed remains in you. You cannot keep on sinning. Let me just say that again. You cannot keep on practicing sinning. He says it's impossible to do that. Why? Because he has been born of God. I'm stressing to you. That if a person says they know Christ, one of the evidence of knowing that you're saved, my friend, is you don't want to do that kind of a lifestyle. You leave that lifestyle. You repent of that lifestyle. You say, you don't desire that kind of a lifestyle. Notice this little picture here. You know, the word hip, you know where the word hypocrite comes from, don't you? Play acting. The, the, you know, in the Greek theaters, they'd hold a mask up and they would play, there's somebody else. You see, only you know if you're play acting. But all I'm telling you, Paul warns you, he does it twice. If this is your lifestyle, those listening maybe on, on the internet, you're listening, we have several who listen online. If that's your lifestyle, no, God says no, that is not acceptable and that is not characteristic of having faith in Jesus Christ. What I'm saying ought to be a change in your life. Fourthly, believe that the Spirit will enable you to overcome. I, I don't want to discourage you here, but now here's, here's what I've said. We're never going to get that perfection on this side of the planet in this world system here. But I do want to say this, we can overcome. We don't have to yield. We don't have to give in. We don't have to say, well, I can't do this. Let me give you some scripture. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. Now let me ask you a question. If he says, let not sin reign in your mortal body, undoubtedly you, you, have, a, you have a choice to make there, right? He says, let not it happen to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members, talking about your body, see, these members here, to sin as instruments of, for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Watch this, for sin will no longer have, what does he say? Dominion over you. He can't control you, that old man. Yes, he pulls your way, but listen, he cannot control you. You have been set free by Jesus. You've got the power of the Spirit in your life. You don't have to give in. Now, let me just share a few things. He says again, do not present your members. See, if you don't believe that you've got the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to overcome these things, a couple of things. We are casting doubt on the Word of God. He says you don't have to have, listen, he does not have dominion in your life. And if you don't believe that, my friend, you're casting doubt on the Word of God. I will also say this. You know what you're going to do? If you don't believe that you can overcome these things in your life, you're going to find excuses for your sin. Huh? Well, nobody's perfect. Everybody sins. Everybody has their weaknesses. Now, you can overcome what I'm saying. Notice, we will not grow and develop in our faith if you have that mindset that you cannot overcome. Listen to me. The power of the Holy Spirit is the same Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. And I'm submitting to you, He can give you an anointing to overcome as you look to God. We will limit the power of, the of our testimony if we don't believe this. Because we're going to find all these little ways that we give in to our flesh. And then we will grieve the Holy Spirit. Folks, I don't know about you, but you know what that means? Make sorry. Can you imagine making the person who is God, the Holy Spirit, in you grieve, sorrowful because of your choices and your sin? The Bible says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And then number five, surrender unconditionally. This is key. Unconditionally. 
to the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God in your life. How many of you know he'll speak to you? He'll speak to you. Notice again, he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Notice, and those who belong to Christ have done something. What does it say? You have crucified, notice this, the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us do what? Keep in step with the Spirit. This verb translated keep in step is a military term. To be drawn in line, stand in a row. I think I got a picture there. You know, keep in step. The Spirit's leading you a certain way. He will lead you by the way to keep the Word of God, will He not? He's going to lead you. You keep in step. Don't you get outside that step. You stay, you stay within the boundaries of, of that step of the Spirit of God in your life. So very critical. Again, Paul's vocabulary to walk in the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, means go where the Spirit's going. Let Him lead you. You listen to Him. Don't listen to other voices. Discern His will. Follow His guidance. Unconditional surrender. Let me just say this. It's a choice. It's a choice. You see, you're going to make all kinds of choices in your life. You realize you've got a choice to make when it comes to walking in the Spirit. Also, unconditional surrender yields to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. He will speak to you. He will impress you. He will lead you. You'll sense the Spirit of God in your life. But you have to be willing to sense that and follow that is what we're saying. Unconditional surrender also is a daily process. Daily process. Notice, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Jesus said this, watch. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross once in a while. Take up his cross daily. What did the cross mean to Jesus? It meant death to self. His ambitions. Listen, even in the garden, he said, Lord, he said, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, let, that is that suffering, that death, let it pass, but not my will, but by thine be done. You see, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses? Forfeits his own soul. Daily is what I'm speaking about here. Daily. Notice what Paul said. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that the old self, what does it say? You see, when you put your faith in Christ, listen to me, that old man, that old self died on a cross. He died on the cross. He was nailed to the cross. What do you mean? That old nature because Christ was your substitute. Notice the very latter part of this verse. If you go to the very end of this passage, it says, So also you must consider yourselves. What does it say there? The King James says, Reckon yourself dead. That is, you have a mindset. Listen to me. You have a mindset that that old man, that Listen, that old nature, he can no longer dominate you. You have to believe that. You reckon him, you consider him dead, you see. I'm just trying to tell you you have to give in. You know, commentary said this. Crucifixion of the flesh is described here not as something done to us, but rather something done by us. Oh, whoa. Yeah. You got, you got some involvement there. Another commentary said this, talking about the crucifixion. The basic demand of Christian discipleship is that we take up our cross daily and follow Christ. Paul stretched this metaphor further by saying that we must not only take up our cross and walk with it, but actually see that the execution takes place. Whoa. Another writer said, crucifixion produced death not suddenly, but gradually. You know, here's what I'm saying. As you go through your Christian life, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have these wrestles, this wrestling with the flesh. But here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you crucify that old man and you put your faith in Christ and you be filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you be led by the Holy Spirit of God, guess what, my friend? He's going to give you the ability, the power, the anointing to overcome those desires in your life. But you have to look to Jesus. Let me just move to a sixth point here and we close this out. 
I think that's where I am, right? I deal with five, right? Okay, six. Don't give the devil any opportunities. Notice this. Kind of a, it's kind of weird how he ended this, but I'll preference something in just a minute. But let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. There's one thing that Paul was dealing with in this church, and church is, was divisions in the body of Christ. Now, he says this in chapter 5, verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So, well, here we have an issue where divisiveness can give the The devil, an opportunity to cause problems and issues and division in the church. But I'm just simply saying this. Don't give him any opportunity, no matter what it is. And you set some boundaries in your life, and you make sure that you don't give the devil any opportunities. Notice what the Bible says in this next verse. The Bible says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Don't you give him an opportunity whatsoever. Let me just show you a little picture here. Next. How many of you leave your doors open at night? How many of you have, how many of you have locks on your doors? Let me see. Raise your hands if you have locks on your doors. How many of you all use those locks at night? Let me see you raise your hands. How many have an alarm system and you set it before you go to bed? Pam and I don't have an alarm system because we have Samson. <laughs> He'll wake us up. Of course, I've had some late elders meetings, and when I come home, he doesn't make a peep. Here's the issue. You don't, know, you don't leave the door cracked. You don't give him any opportunities. You don't give him any leadways. Why? Because he's the enemy. He's going to do that. He'll just slip right on in. See. Well, if you're living the Spirit-filled life, I close with this. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. The Spirit-filled life, listen, thank the Lord for the gifts of the Holy Spirit of God, 